Hello students, I am Dr. Ruchi Raj, your prosthodontics mentor and today I have come up with the previous year questions marathon by DBMCI for the subject of prosthodontics. All of you must be very well aware that PYQs are extremely important to secure a very good rank in your entrance exam, be it INICT or NEET. Personally, I believe that a single mistake in PYQ can cost you your rank in any of these exams. They are extremely important to secure your dream seat as well as your dream rank. Also, previous year questions would make us familiar with topics from which questions can get repeated also and even new topics can come. So with this idea in mind, DBMCI decided that we start with a revision of previous year questions, which is your PYQ's marathon. Here we aim to teach you about 15 to 20 previous year questions in a duration of about 45 minutes to one hour. And the aim of this entire session is that we quickly revise the important previous year questions from the past recent exam papers and see the answer for them, see what other probable questions can come out of it. So without wasting any further time, let us begin with the first question of prosthodontics. And the question says that after making a full inlay wax pattern, it is melted from the margin of the pattern. The purpose of this is what? Option A, for better adaptation and reduce the dissolution of luting agent. B, should never be done as it distorts the wax pattern. Option C, it increases retention. Option D, it increases resistance to fracture. Now, what is it saying? There is a particular wax pattern. And after you make the full inlay, that means the full crown pattern, they are saying that we are dissolving it from the marginal side and then we are relining or readapting it. What is the purpose of it? The purpose of this is for better adaptation and to reduce the dissolution of luting agent. Now, we are very well aware that all of the waxes release internal stresses on cooling. Whenever we do wax pattern adaptation, we heat it up drop by drop, adapt it onto the die, and then we make the full crown pattern. As the pattern cools down, it will release something which is called as internal stresses. This will lead to a distortion of the pattern. All of this distortion occurs at micro levels, but then again, we also know that leakage also occurs at micro levels, and this micro leakage in future can lead to dissolution of the luting agent as well as a failure of the restoration due to any other secondary reasons in future. So as to avoid that and have a very well fitted restoration onto the tooth or the prepared tooth, what we do at the end of wax pattern preparation is that we dissolve the one millimeter portion that is close to the margin and we reline or readapt it preferably with a red marginal wax only, and then we immediately invest this wax pattern. So the purpose of it is for better adaptation and reduce the dissolution of the luting agent. We use a red marginal wax for it, so as to do this process, and this is generally done for all of the wax patterns, even for your copings also, because a marginal fit of restoration is extremely important. If there is a micro leakage or a micro gap, it can lead to dissolution of whatever lutic agent you have used so as to cement the restoration. Also, this micro gap can in future lead to percolation of saliva in other oral fluids, secondarily can infect the tooth also, and as we all know, caries can occur secondarily and lead to failure of this restoration. So a very good adaptation of the restoration, extremely important. And this small step can lead to a very big way for the longevity of a restoration. So the answer here is option number A for better adaptation and to reduce the dissolution of your luting agent. Coming to question number two, your special or custom tray is fabricated with polymethyl with acrylic. It can be made how many hours before? The procedure, option A, before one hour, B, before 24 hours, option C, just before, and option D, before eight hours. And the correct answer here is, the question again takes its source from dental materials. You can see how beautifully actually prosto and dental materials are entwined. And if you're good at DM, you would be able to solve a lot of questions of prosto. 
So special or custom tray fabricated with PMMA can be made or rather should be made 24 hours before any impression procedure to be made with that particular custom tray. Now this is applicable even if you're making it for partial dentures, complete dentures, implants, FPD, anything, any procedure. If you are going to make an impression with an acrylic custom tray made of self-cure resin, make it 24 hours before so that whatever excess monomer is, it leaches out. Whatever polymerization shrinkage is going to happen, that happens. And when you make an impression after that, it does not happen. Now, the idea here is supposedly I make a tray 30 minutes before my process or procedure, make an impression. After the impression has been made, the monomer is still leaching out supposedly or is uh, evaporating into the air, whatever is excess, some dimensional changes are happening into the tray. That can actually modify impression again at micro levels. Dentistry is all about micro levels. So that can distort your elastomeric or any impression that you have made into that particular tray. And a distorted impression can never lead to a perfect restoration. All the details that are there are incorporated in every single step of any dental procedure. And this eventually leads to a very good restoration or a very good impression or a procedure or a process. So taking care of all of these small, small things, if you do it 24 hours before, whatever shrinkage or dimensional changes are going to happen, they will be happened, they'll be done. And now you will be having a stable tray for making an impression. So the ideal time for making a custom tray is 24 hours before your process or procedure. So the answer here is option B, 24 hours before. Question number three, condyla guidance is controlled by all except. Most important word is except. Options A, anterior guidance. Option B, muscle tone. Option C, nerve control. And option D, bone fossa. We are very well aware that condyla guidance is what? When a condyle along with its disc traverses along the slope of the articular eminence, the path that is generated and the influence that the slope has, that particular, that influence, you can term it as condylar guidance. Now, the disc, the pathway that the condyle takes, the muscles and ligaments, the shape of the articular eminence, all of this, the glenoid fossa, all of this are responsible for a change in the value of condylar guidance or rather they influence what value of condylar guidance we have in a patient. Remember, condylar guidance is a value that we measure or we obtain from a patient. But as a dentist, we cannot change it. We can just measure it from your patient. And there are several factors that will influence the number or the value of it. These factors are your muscle tones, your nerve, as well as the bone fossa. But what does not influence it? Anterior guidance will not influence it. Anterior guidance does not influence the value of condylar guidance. Anterior guidance, very briefly, what is it? It is the influence of the contacting surfaces of your anterior teeth and even the protrusion of mandal is going to affect your condylar guidance, but definitely not your anterior guidance. These are all different factors that are responsible for balancing of occlusion and several other occlusion parameters also, or generally in setting of an occlusion. But we may think that Condylar guidance, anterior guidance, all of these are linked to each other. So definitely they may influence each other. No, anterior guidance has no role to play in the value of condylar guidance. The value that we obtain from a patient via what? Protrusive records, right? So definitely we will not have any influence of anterior guidance on the condylar guidance. Question number four. Which of this is a contraindication for your porcelain veneer? Option A, 2 millimeter diastema, definitely indicated over here. 
high aesthetic demand again veneers are indicated here large extensive restoration or a discolor too now it is a very straightforward answer a very large extensive restoration which is placed on the tooth will not have sufficient tooth structure so as to place a restoration like a veneer Veneers ideally would have an excellent bond strength if the preparation is in enamel only, not even in dentine. So you need sufficient tooth structure for bonding of these restorations with the tooth and having a large extensive restoration. Firstly, veneer, there is no probability that we would be able to bond it. Secondly, because you have a large extensive restoration on the tooth, it would rather require a restoration that would probably cap the cusps or even provide support to the existing structure of the tooth. Your veneer plays a no role, rather a full coverage restoration might be required in such a case, right? So let us have a look at the indications, contraindications, advantages and disadvantages of veneers. And as we mentioned earlier, a discolored tooth or a damaged tooth, all of these are indications of your veneers and contraindications would be having extensive restorations, having an unfavorable bite of your patient, bruxer patients, poor plaque control of your patients or high caries index of your patients. These are all contraindications for your veneers. Veneers would offer you superior aesthetics as well as they give you wear and stain resistance and disadvantages are that it is very expensive and it slightly alters the contour of a tooth. Now, coming to question number five, tapping of bone is done before implant. It is done for what situation? Now, tapping of bone, it is a procedure during placement of an implant. In which situation would you prefer to do it? In a dense bone, option number A, in a moderate density bone, in a soft bone, or it is done irrespective of the density of a bone. Here, the correct answer is the dense bone. Now, a bone tap is used in a D1, preferably quality of a bone. The reason for it is that D1 is a very dense bone, like a cortical bone only. Cancellous bone is almost zero to nothing over here. Whenever you drill through it or when the thread formations are happening, there is some metal also remaining behind of the drills over there plus there's a lot of heat generation over there so bone tapping is done so as to have a more passive implant placement the word here is you want a more passive implant placement and you want to protect the body of the implant from being damaged during insertion with the insertion wrench. So in a very dense wound, sometimes remnants of drill are also remaining inside the osteotomy site. And when two dissimilar metals would be aligned against each other, there are chances of corrosion also in long-term cases. So as to prevent all of that, a bone tap is done in a dense bone. So correct answer here is option number A, dense bone. Now coming to question number six, match the following denture problem with their causes. And you have a column A and you have a column B over here. And uh, okay, let us start matching it. Tongue biting, it happens because of what? It happens due to a constricted arch. Cheek biting happens because of what? You have cheek biting when you have reduced overjet. So one should be A, two should be D. Clicking sound is because of porcelain teeth. So three should be B. And full appearance of your face is because of increase in VDO. So four should be C. And if we see 1A, 2D, 3B and 4C, it is option number C here. Now, this is a very good question here actually to evaluate the student on troubleshooting in complete dentures. And time and again, I have highlighted this to all of our students that troubleshooting in complete dentures is something from which you will have a question in exam, whether it would be from the phonetics part, whether it would be from this part. 
vertical dimension phonetics, even something concerning to clicking sound of teeth, etc. These are very, very commonly asked previous year questions, absolutely being repeated like anything in every exam. This is something I'll call you cash marks to you. If you make mistakes here, you're losing your rank in such questions. So comprehensively, I have included this table here. If you prefer, you can even make a screenshot of it and troubleshooting in complete dentures, it is extensive. But from the top of my head, what I can say is if you have reduced overjet, you will have cheek biting. If you have a constricted arch or a lingual placement of teeth, you will have cramping of tongue. If you have clicking sound, it could be because of your presence of porcelain teeth used in dentures or Reduction in freeway space, when you have increase in video and there is absolutely no freeway space, the teeth would hit each other whenever you are speaking or doing any function. And that time you would also have a clicking sound. And read up everything on increase and decrease in video, the consequences of it. That would 100% be asked in any form in exam for. So, that is pertaining to question number 6. Now, starting with question number seven, direction of cord tucker for placing the gingival retraction cord is what? Now, we are talking about the direction of a cord tucker while placing a gingival retraction cord. And supposedly, this is my tooth preparation and I have my sulcus here and I, I want to put in a cord over here. Should it be directed towards the tooth? Should it be directed towards the gingiva? Should it be according to the tooth position or is it according to operator's choice? Now, for such things, generally, such questions, if you're unaware of the answer, remember, usually such details in procedures are always outlined and there's a reasoning behind it. So options like depending upon position of tooth or depending upon the operator's choice can usually not be the answer. So you would be left with two options now, towards the tooth or towards the gingiva. Now think of it, you're tucking something into the sulcus. If the direction is towards the gingiva, won't you harm the gingiva in the process? Say you are a beginner and you push it too much and you say by mistake harm the gingiva if the direction is towards it. But if you do it towards the tooth, you have a positive surface to rest also and there is no harm done to any structure. So by that logic also, you can come or reach to the answer, which is option number A, direction of the cord tucker always should be towards the tooth while placing the retraction cord into the gingival sulcus, never towards the gingiva and never definitely according to what the operator wants. So that was question number seven. Coming to question number eight, another very important topic from the topic of retraction and tooth preparation, steps used for double retraction cord technique during FPD impression is what? Option number A, thin cord is placed first. Option number B, thick cord is placed first. Option number C, thick cord is removed before the impression. Option number D, thin cord is retained before the impression. And option number E, both are removed before the impression. Now, answer here is what? We'll try to understand what is correct here. So, let us see one by one all of the options. Thin cord, is it placed first? Yes, this is correct. Thick cord is placed first? No, this is wrong. Thick cord is removed before the impression? Yes, that is also correct. Thin cord is retained before the impression? Yes, that is also correct. And both are removed before the impression, no. So option A, C and D, they are correct, which aligns to option number A here, which is A, C and D. So our answer is option number A, A, C and D. Let us understand it through this particular image. When we have a double chord technique, in the double cord technique, what we do is a thin cord is placed without overlap at the bottom of the gingival crevice. So you can very well see this is our thin cord 
it is placed at the bottom bottom of the sulcus like this and over that a second cord is placed on the top like this this is the thicker cord it would be placed on top of it and the thicker cord is placed to obtain lateral displacement right so it is removed the thicker cord is removed before impression and thin cord is left into the sulcus during the impression procedure right it is always left into the sulcus whereas uh, the thicker cord is removed during the or rather before the impression procedure so this is your double cord technique i have seen probably this coming in the recent papers quite a few times so take out some time try to understand this particular technique this is how pyqs would help you when you can identify topics that this particular topic is coming very frequently in the exam that is how then you identify that okay next time probably a new question can also come from a pyq and hence pyqs are extremely important for any exam question number 10 Limiting structure in the distolingual sulcus of mandibular arch while recording impression is what? It is asking about your distolingual sulcus. Is it a superior constrictor, b temporalis, c buccinator, and d masseter? Now, if you are aware where the spatial orientation of your muscles is, you should be knowing the answer, which is option number a, superior constrictor. now time and again while teaching anatomical landmarks i have highlighted it so many times that the posterior part of the mandible at the retromolar pad area and the relationships of muscles is extremely important because somewhere here or there a question is framed out of it and is asked in exam so let us try and understand the spatial orientations of muscles here posterior to it is tendon of temporalis laterally if this is the lateral side if this is the medial side right laterally first would come buccinator and outside it would come masseter and on the lingual side you will have your superior constrictor and pterygomandibular raphae so the question asks distal lingual part of it and hence the answer to it is your superior constrictor now another question is the influence of masseter on buccinator which leads to the formation of masseteric notch so a very small segment of anatomical landmarks but very frequently asked questions from this segment and this is something very nicely a photo is given in vouchers for it and something that all of you should be knowing now coming to an off beat question from your pyqs just to make you aware that sometimes something like this also can be asked in exam helkimo index is related to what is it masticatory muscle efficiency salivary gland dysfunction peri implant bone loss or periodontal disorder now the answer to it is masticatory muscle efficiency the reason is that helkimo index it was published the reference have included in the journal of cranio mandibular practice it is a well founded index to assess temporomandibular joint disorders very specifically so masticatory muscle disorders come as a sub segment of it in a specified population and usually the indexes are given somewhat like this you would have your symptom which is say supposedly an impaired range of movement and then there is criteria of it is it normal is it slightly impaired or is it severely impaired and then you score it likewise second is impaired tmj function you will have two three again different criterias and then you score your patient likewise so the different symptoms that are being scored are impaired range of movement impaired tmj function muscle pain tmj pain and pain on movement of mandible 
on the basis of this, you fill up a score of your patient and then you get to know the patient lies in which score. There are different criteria like this also, such as rating the mandibular mobility, TMJ dysfunction, muscle pain, and TMJ pain. So, Helkimo index, it is actually such questions are taken out from articles and uh, some uh, studies are conducted in a specified population and index has been released but eventually over time the index becomes popular and is widely applied and generalized also and then questions pertaining to this can be asked in exam supposedly something like this is a new question in your exam how much ever you prepare you cannot complete the entire syllabus or you cannot know everything even many postgraduates are not aware of this so what do you do in such situations? If you are able to identify something and probably try and attempt a question like this, attempt it if it is a new question. If, however, you feel that this is completely new and you have absolutely no idea, I suggest skip the question to avoid the negative marking. Reason being, what is new for you would be new for 90% of the people if your preparation is appropriate, apt and at level. So essentially, the question will have not much of influence on the final ranking here. That is my strategy to appear for such questions in exam. However, if it is a repeat question without any mistake, attempt these questions to perfection. Reason is that such repeat questions are those questions where other people whose preparation is average might make a mistake. So there you have an advantage. So take such questions with much more seriousness. Try to read around it a little bit so that you gain an edge in your exam. Question number 11, a 70 year old patient has candidiasis under maxillary denture, which is the local cause for it. Option A, denture not cleaned properly, patient on long term steroids, age of the patient and malnutrition. Now, even if I don't know anything about it, I've kept this question very specifically so as to teach you one tip of attending questions. If supposedly I know nothing about it, I know what local and systemic means. And what does it ask? It asks for a local cause. And all of you, I think by now are aware that patient taking long-term steroids, age or malnutrition are systemic factors or general factors and not local factor. The only local factor here is denture not cleaned properly. And the answer also is that, that when denture locally is not cleaned properly, it will lead to a growth of candida albicans and subsequently candidiasis, denture stomatitis will happen. Patient would be advised to remove the denture, clean it properly, treatment would be necessary for it, stopping the denture usage for some time. If the denture is poorly fitting, probably relining may also be needed for it. And denture hygiene instructions need to be reinforced to these patients. So the correct answer here is denture not being cleaned properly. And also, you understand one tip out of this is that read your question thoroughly. It is asking for a local cause. See what is a local cause over here and then attempt your question. That is why I always say, read your question carefully. I had done a small video on tips and tricks to attend questions. And the first tip was, read your question carefully. This is why I say, read your question carefully and not just in a flow blindly. Question 12, most common cause of caste restriction failure. Now, it is asking for most common cause. That means that the options mentioned below are causes of failure, but what is the most common one? Is it ceramic failure or fracture? K 
caries periodontitis or general fracture the correct answer here is option d caries without a doubt it has been identified and published in several studies that the reason for failure of a restoration and what we discussed in question number one is caries happening due to micro leakage percolation of oral fluid secondary caries or even an in, improper rct done for a tooth that will lead to a secondarily infected tooth and maybe even a periapical lesion and eventual failure of your restoration so answer here is option number d which is caries Question number 13, which of these is true about a rest seat? Should it have a sharp line angle? Floor should be occlusal to marginal ridge. Marginal ridge should be reduced. And rest seat and minor connector should be connected at 90 degrees or a greater angle. Now from the options you can identify, it is talking about an occlusal rest seat, not an incisal or a cingulum rest seat. And the correct answer here is marginal ridge should be reduced. Precisely, it should be reduced by 1.5 millimeters so that you have sufficient bulk of metal at the marginal ridge and the uh, cast partial nature does not break at this junction. Should it have a sharp line angle? No, it should have rounded angles and floor should always be below. Actually, in the central fossa, it should be 2.5 millimeters. At the marginal ridge, it is 1.5. So it is sloping towards the center like this. And the floor should be at 2.5. Marginal ridge should be at 1.5. You have a positive rest seat. And the angle that it forms with the minor connector should be less than 90 degrees. So these are specifications of occlusal rest and rest seat. Also very frequently asked in exam. Be very thoroughly aware of it to take up your cash points in exam. Coming to question number 14, now a very simple question from implant and quite frequently repeated in exam. In the image shown below, what is the, it is asking minimum space required between two remaining teeth for insertion of two 5 millimeter diameter implants. So let us do the mathematics of it. Already our implants are 5 millimeters, so that amounts to 10. And you need to know two information here from planning and implant restoration is that between two implants, you need a space of 3 millimeters. So add that up over here. Between the tooth and the implant, you need a space of 1.5 millimeters. So add that up over here. Totally, it amounts to 16 millimeters, which is option number C over here. The correct answer is option number C, 16 millimeters for us. And that is the general math of it. A very simple question. Distance between two implants should always be 3 millimeters. You preserve that bone, that amount of bone in it. And distance between a tooth and an implant should be 1.5 millimeters minimum. This is not the maximum. This is the minimum distance that you keep. If you keep it less than that, chances are the bone can actually resorb and you will not have a surrounding supporting bone around the implant. That will be a problematic situation for you. So minimum this much distance is required whenever we plan an implant. So ideally when I see a case, I would see the distance between the two tooth. I'll calculate whatever minimum distance is required and on the basis of that. I come to the diameter of what implant I can choose. So question number 14, a very nice question that is used in day-to-day -day practice. This is the image for it. See, the minimum distance is 1.5 millimeters between implants and the tooth and between two implants, it is 3 millimeters. Now, again, another question from implants is what? After implant placement, ideal yearly bone loss should be. The word here is ideal. Bone loss changes over a period of time. In the first year, it is more. Eventually, it declines. But it is asking about ideal yearly bone loss, which has been said in various studies. It should be around 0.2 millimeters. That is the ideal bone loss that should be there. So what is the criteria for implant success? It says that individual unattached implant is immobile when tested clinically and vertical bone loss should be less than 0.2 millimeters annually after the first year of service. Now, these are certain criteria for success of an implant. If we see 
clinically there should not be any pain or tenderness upon the function and mobility should not be present and ideally you should have only about 0.2 millimeters of bone loss after the first year of service apart from that we will call it survival if the factors are slightly lesser than that a compromised health and a failure on the basis of these clinical conditions and then appropriately we have our treatment for the condition of the implant so success is what less than 2 millimeters of radiographic bone loss from initial surgery probing depth less than 5 millimeters and bleeding on probing should be 0 to 1 or probably nothing only even with no exudate history so that is pertaining to the success of an implant you can even have a satisfactory survival a compromised survival or a failure so next time a question can be changed as something over here could be mentioned that in a compromised survival how much amount of bone loss do you see this particular chart is helpful for you then Coming to question number 16, anterior guidance can be altered by which of the following? Changing the lingual inclines of upper anteriors, reshaping the incisal edges of upper posteriors, deepening the bite or opening the bite. A very straightforward question. You can get the answer even if you know the definition of anterior guidance, which is that it is the influence of the contacting surface of the anterior teeth how the labial surface would glide along the lingual or palatal surface of upper anteriors that influence that it has that is called as your anterior guidance of your anterior guidance of that particular patient or a case so when you change the shape of the palatal surface of upper anteriors you're changing the anterior guidance when you change your overjet when you change your overbite again you're changing your anterior guidance here so definitely that would do reshaping the edges of posteriors or deepening or opening the bite of your patient that does not have that influence that option number a has so it is a very straightforward answer over there question 17 surgical removal of palatal tori is rarely done and mandibular tori is done quite frequently surgical removal of a palatal tori is indicated when first option it is extending to the soft palate Second is it is extending to the posterior palatal seal area, cancerophobia, unfavorable undercuts and impingement on the soft tissue. The correct answer for this is option D, all of the above. The most important reason I would say for removal of a palatal tori would be its extension into the soft palate and when it encroaches onto the posterior palatal seal area, you are not able to make an effective posterior seal the prosthesis is compromised over there and hence you probably need to get it removed. Second reason is the phobia for cancer. Third is when you have an unfavorable undercut and impingement on the tissue. All of these are reasons for removal of a palatal tori when you are doing a removable prosthesis or any prosthesis that sits onto the palate. Supposedly you can exclude it then you don't need to remove your tori. So in all of the cases where you have to uh, rest or take support from the palate. In that case where your tori is uh, offending you, in that situation, you go for removal of your palatal tori. What is the least probable complication of psychomatic implant? Is it sinusitis, facial nerve dysfunction, orbital floor fracture and aspergillosis? correct answer according to research and documentation of data is facial nerve dysfunction. Now the first and foremost actually problem that we see with zygomatic implant is problems with osseointegration. integration and Based on the anatomic location of where it is, it can even lead to sinusitis, orbital floor fracture or even other fungal issues also. But the facial nerve that comes here, chances of that dysfunction are lesser in comparison to the other problems that are there. Most important problem that you see is the problem with osseointegration. So just keep that in mind. This is a question on the basis of data and something that needs to be remembered. Question from your last INICT exam in May, Pontic design shown in the image below. Now, I have said it 100 times, I would say it one time. Pontic is something 
you read thoroughly as if you know everything about Pontech because this is something that I'm observing is coming in every exam. So Pontex, you just cannot make a mistake in Pontex. Just read it, remember everything that is there about Pontex. Now here, how do you tackle a question like this? Pontic design shown in the image below and its use. Is it rich lap, modified rich lap, and where is it in incisor or molar? Even any person can identify. If you can just identify, this is a modified rich lap Pontic. What tooth has been shown here as an illustration? It is an incisor. So automatically, the option becomes option number two and three. That is your B and C and two and three, which is the correct answer here that modified ridge lap and your incisors. Why modified ridge lap? You see this gap over here. In a ridge lap, it would cover everything like this. And then you get no space for cleaning from the palatal aspect. In a modified ridge lap, you get this space here where you can, you can put your hygiene aid or cleaning aid and you can clean it from the palatal side. And you get superior aesthetics on the labial side because of overlap. And it is indicated in anterior tools, even maxillary posteriors also when you have a wider smile. So look at illustrations like these. Take some presence of mind, take a moment here and think if the illustration itself shows it on an incisor, it is indicated on an incisor. I just need to identify what kind of contact design it is, which is a modified rich lab and hence the answer. This is a extremely important table for you in terms of context. If you want, take a screenshot of it. And what I taught you was this modified rich lab, the question, modified rich lab. And it is mainly indicated in anteriors, even in some premolars and molars. Saddle or rich lap is somewhat like this. Now it is not very frequently indicated. And the last question of today's session is what? Porcelain artificial teeth bond to the acrylic base with what? Dietorics, chemical bonding, cyanoacrylate and fusion at high temperature. The correct answer is a dietoric holes. As we are aware that porcelain and acrylic cannot chemically bond to each other. So mechanically you need some form of retention for which what we do, we create a hole like this and then these holes will now have mechanical retention via pins and that hole is called as a dietoric. Now this is also a very good question. The reason is dietoric as a word generally would not give it off that this is the answer. This is a question that used to be asked in PGYY exams also. So I personally like this question in exam and something that is now quite frequently repeated in your exams and you should be aware how porcelain bonds to your acrylic denture base with this. I come to an end for today's PYQ marathon session. I hope this was insightful and helpful to all of you. This is a sincere effort to make you realize that previous year questions are as important as new topics and new questions, if not more, and something that you should not make mistakes in. This is Dr. Ruchi Raj. If you have any mistakes, doubts, queries, questions, or suggestions for us, please put it down in the comment box below and we'll be helpful out for every doubt or query of yours. We would always be ready and willing to help you all and have a wonderful preparation and all the best for your upcoming exams.